Randy Stair, better known by his online pseudonym Andrew Blaze, was a 24-year-old from Northeast Pennsylvania with aspirations of becoming the next big YouTube sensation. Andrew began posting videos as a teenager on his original channel Pioneers Productions in 2008. There he focused on comedy skits and short films. After years without any luck, he decided to create an entirely new channel, this time focusing on animation. However, unbeknownst to his friends and family alike, this would be Andrew's last creative endeavor. While working on his channel on the side, Andrew found employment at a local grocery store where he worked an overnight shift. In the late hours of Thursday, June 8th, 2017, he gunned down three of his coworkers in cold blood before taking his own life. What has so many people fascinated, or more appropriately mortified at this entire situation, is the trail that Andrew left behind on both his channel and social media. Just a few hours before the attacks took place, he uploaded a 42-minute manifesto to Ember's Ghost Squad. On today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at Andrew Blaze's work and try to explain what his motivations behind the killings were. If you're familiar with this case at all, then you'll know that Andrew left behind much more than just one final video. Before we get to that, what exactly was on this final video? The video begins with text slides written in letter format from Andrew himself. There, he expresses his frustrations with his YouTube career and lack of support from fellow creators who had agreed to collaborate with him. He says how the channel was meant to be something amazing and unique, but his dreams had been shot down because of those who refused to work with him. From then on, the video transitions into live action with a voiceover from Andrew. There, he talks about how the Ember's Ghost Squad, or EGS, is going to rule the world and that there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. The thing is, for Andrew, Ember's Ghost Squad was much more than just the name of his YouTube channel, but more on that later. The live-action segment continues, showing Andrew in his room along with the shotguns he used to carry out the attack. A musical segment begins, showing a montage of Andrew's room, journals, sketches, and even clips of him working at the grocery store he would later massacre. What unfolds next is an animated segment called Westboro High Massacre, which Andrew chose to dedicate to none other than Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. It's exactly what you'd expect. The animated version of Andrew's fantasy involving him and a friend opening fire on a high school, ending as many lives as possible. Once this wraps up, we get a lengthy monologue from Andrew, followed by yet another montage sequence, this time showing his progression throughout his decade on YouTube and his appreciation for the fans he's acquired over that time. The thing is, if you were already a follower of the EGS channel, then this video may not have seemed all that out of the ordinary. EGS focused on a slightly modified version of a character called Ember McLean from the Nickelodeon TV show Danny Phantom. Andrew identified so much with this character that she became somewhat of his alter ego. This is why the character speaks with a male voice on the EGS channel despite being female. Everything's going according to plan. People are being shot left and right on Earth. And to think, I helped contribute to it all. It's pretty surreal. Ember was meant to be somewhat of a ringleader to a fictional ghost squad consisting of a handful of other members, hence the name Ember's Ghost Squad. The channel was dedicated to fleshing out each of these individual characters in the form of cassette tapes where the characters often express their discontent towards life and whatever else may be on their minds. Anyone who stumbled upon this channel may have taken it as a work of fiction. In fact, the channel featured a number of other female voice actors who most likely had no idea what was actually going on in Andrew's head. To him, the EGS was much, much more than just a made-up story. As I mentioned earlier, the 42-minute YouTube video isn't all Andrew left behind. In the video's description, there were three links to Mediafire.com. These same links were also posted on his Twitter account just before the murders took place. The first link led to an archive of Andrew's entire body of work since he started in 2008. The second link contained a set of suicide tapes, and the final link focused on the journals he showed in his last video. These files feature hours and hours of material, but I'm going to attempt to summarize them to the best of my ability. As I said, the first collection is an archive of Andrew's work since he first started on YouTube, but it also contained a five-page Word document that was essentially his written suicide note. There, he goes into a bit more detail about the topics he touched on in his final upload. The letter starts off with, It is with great pride and confidence that I present to you the biggest release of my life. 
This digital set is nearly everything you could ever want to have as a fan of my content. It is also, however, my last contribution to the World Wide Web. Unfortunately, by the time most of you read this, I will be dead. I will die at age 24, and will be where I truly belong, in the EGS. From there, Andrew goes on to explain how he'd been conspiring to end his own life since as early as 2012, following what he called a streak of bad luck and the deaths of some old friends. He explains how Ember McLean led him to discovering who he really was, and that his online persona wasn't a persona at all, but rather his true identity. It's there that Andrew also begins going into detail about how he felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. He says, It's time for me to shed this putrid host of flesh and bones and forever live in the EGS. I'm a girl who's been trapped in a man's body for two and a half decades and I need to get the hell out. I don't belong on this planet, nor have I ever. I need to die and I'm taking whomever I can down with me. Andrew also once again reiterates his frustrations with his YouTube career, stating, I won't lie, I wish my channels exploded with viewership in my nine years. It was decent views, but I was always on the outside looking in compared to the popular channels. It took me until now to realize that it just wasn't in my soul contract. If EGS blows up after I'm dead, then I accomplished something. I was just never meant to be famous while I was alive. I wanted fame, I wanted to be recognized on the street, I wanted to be in movies or have documentaries made about me. I always dreamed of getting somewhere, but it wasn't meant to happen. The link containing his journals document Andrew's thoughts and feelings throughout the final six months of his life in somewhat of a diary format. A lot of the same information is repeated, sometimes nearly word for word in his Suicide Tapes audio album consisting of 16 different tracks. There, Andrew speaks for hours and hours about his suicidal thoughts, the influence Columbine had on him, his beliefs surrounding the afterlife and different dimensions, and how ghost squads work. I know the surrealness of all this is probably creeping in right now with you thinking, I'm watching him right now, and he's dead, you know? Today's April 4th, 2017, and I have just over five months to live. It's looking like September 7th is going to be the day, the night rather, and here I am. In 10th grade, it was a really rough year, and this was during the time when something started to change with me, which is also when you start going through puberty and stuff. And I had a very high voice throughout <laughs> most of my life, and in 10th I would say the very end of 10th grade is when it finally started to get a little deeper. But was, what was also weird was I found myself wearing women's clothing from my mom's closet. And I just loved it. And I couldn't explain the feeling. It just felt, it just felt like right in a way. It's very hard to explain, but it wasn't like I was gay because I knew I didn't like guys. I never was attracted to guys. I was always attracted to girls in high school. I would always be looking at their legs or at their chest, at their hair, at their eyes, at their crotch, you know, what you do as a guy. But I always just envisioned myself being one of them. And I was just never as like my high school years went on. I just felt more and more lost. Like I had no clue what I was, but I knew flat out that I wasn't gay. I fucking hate guys. I hate the facial hair they have. I hate their crotches. I hate the way their body structure is. I hate them being really muscular and jacked. You know, I just always hated guys. I was never into guys. They just disgust me. They really do. Honestly, guys are just the most disgusting thing on this planet. If you look back, 2013 was when I got word that Matt died. It was January of 2013. Two months after that, in March, was when I got into Ember and never got out of her. March 2013 was when I made the Black Ops 2 emblem of Ember McLean for Xbox. And I ended up using it everywhere from then on out. There were these silhouette arts that I made where you can't see the face, but you can see the border of the hair and the face and the body. And that ended up being the recruiter ghost. And at the time, I had no idea. So before you knew it, Ember was appearing everywhere on my YouTube channel, Pioneers Productions. It was the profile picture, it was in the end screen, it was on my Twitter, on my Facebook, in my gaming videos. She was everywhere. And it didn't really make too many people question why which I don't know why, <laughs> it took a while, but then once I started showing her in the, the EGS prologue series, that's when things started to be questioned by people. 
I just kept looking at her, and it's like, she got it. She understood me. I understood her. We had feelings for each other. And it just, it was way more than just a simple connection. It was life-changing. And this is just a static 2D flattened image on a screen, you know? And I just, I went into a zone that I had never really been in before. Nothing seemed to matter. It was just like a magical dark place and it was a dark place it wasn't happy sunshine rainbow stuff it was a dark and depressing place and Amber just I felt like I could trust her I felt like we had known each other before and I just felt like I could have been her in a way there's this whole world full of these ghosts and I'm one of them I was sent here to do this. I was physically sent here to spread this cause. To start this cult. And whatever happens, happens. Like everything you've ever known about religion is a lie. It's not just a heaven on the other side. There's dimensions and dimensions of different squads your soul can end up anywhere you know, if you've had a friend pass away it doesn't mean they went up to heaven that might not even exist for all I know went to another dimension got recruited by a squad somewhere where he was destined to be all along like all these things happen for a reason that's what I can't emphasize enough it's like you see people die when they're like fucking four years old well, they're needed somewhere. It's like, it's not just, oh, it was just an accident, freak accident, shit happens. No, it was meant to happen. It's like me. I feel like I was meant to be, I was meant to die young. I was always meant to die young. And I wish I could have died as a teenager, but I, just, I couldn't do it then. There's plenty of dimensions besides this one in the afterlife there's so many dimensions it goes on forever there it's like it's endless and in all these dimensions exist different squads where your soul ends up and how you get there is by these squads recruiting you they analyze you on a daily basis they scout for these souls and when they find ones that fit their interest you know fit their traits and description they recruit you or they plan to recruit you some like some things their planned deaths. You know, you see all these crazy fucking ways people die. It's not just and a freak accident, like I said before. These squads stage these deaths. These are how souls disappear from this world. I love being the center of attention. Although I'm not very vocal sometimes, but I love people focusing on me. I love being looked up upon. I love attention. And I love it. I just, I fucking love it. I love having a fan base that just eats up what I put out. I'd kill to have more. I just, you can never have enough. I know it's just like an illusion with people. It's just text on a screen, but they're actual people. But knowing I can manipulate people and just, they can do whatever I say. It's crazy, like, Columbine just sucked me in once I started following it, and I've honestly never been the same since. Um, I think in one of my classes I heard them mention Columbine and all this when we were talking about, like, big world-changing events or something, I don't know. But I never really looked into it until I was out of college. Pretty much last year was when it started, and... It just, it changed so much for me. I honestly cannot believe how much Columbine has influenced me and changed me. It's really insane. And I don't know what it is about it. There's been so many mass shootings over the years or catastrophic events and all this. And for some reason, Columbine just feels different compared to everything else. And I don't know. I guess I can just relate to it a lot in a way. But 
Columbine is just one of those things that just sucked me in. And I can't even explain it. It just, it grabbed me like very few other things have in my life. And the more I like researched and studied it, the more I got sucked into it. And I, you know, I watched all these documentaries on it. And it's just, it made me have so many questions. I just love the shit out of Columbine. And I can't go around the internet saying, hey, hey, hey I love Columbine. Eric Harris is fucking amazing. Oh, I love Dylan too. I love them. I wish I could have met them. They're my heroes and blah, blah. You know, you can't do that or you're going to get like fucking reported as a threat. You see all these people that get caught and all their plans are foiled from people reporting them, you know, for conspiring a Columbine like shooting or something. And you just got to be careful with what you say. Um, yeah, so bought some shooting gloves and they'll be here any day now. Bought a like a fanny pack bag holder for shells and a holster for the shotgun. Um, I'm thinking maybe by the end of summer I'll buy a second one um, for when I do the deed at the supermarket. So um, I always just I've always been paranoid about just having the one gun because if it breaks down on you or if it jams and you have no way of fixing it. You will never be able to off yourself, you know? So having a backup secondary weapon is crucial. You need to have that for a situation like that. And I've always wondered, like, the biggest question I have is, how long will it take for the police to know that that happened? Because, you know, you got all the security cameras and everything in the store, and there's some houses across the street. But, I mean, if I actually was able to shoot and kill, like, the three to four people that could be in there and none of them got a call out to 911 would it take until like 5 30 in the morning until anyone realized that there was something wrong you know that's what i always wondered about like how much time would you have the remaining files andrew left behind mainly consist of videos of him at target practice and detailed plans behind the attack as I said, there's hours of material to go through, so there just isn't any way I could possibly cover every single detail of it. But if you wish, you can sort through all of these for yourself. Before this video ends, I just want to give a huge thank you to all my patrons. If you like what I do here, then consider supporting the show via Patreon. Links down below, and with that being said, I'll see you all soon with yet another video.